The Lord be with you. Thank you very much. There's uh, several texts that we'll look at uh, this morning. Uh, so when I was at the cem- cemetery, I almost said cemetery. <laughs> I meant seminary. <laughs> Oopsie. <laughs> Some days the seminary felt like a cemetery, let me tell you. <laughs> but when I was there, I took uh, Hebrew from Dr. Schrieber. And Dr. Schrieber, amazing man. Uh, seven children. Three of them were special needs kids, by the way. Uh, just amazing man. Uh, but uh, great, great linguist, great scholar, especially with Hebrew. He's very tough. Toughest Hebrew prof that, that was at the seminary at the time. Uh, in fact, uh, my story is the first week, actually the first day, he calls on me to translate Hebrew. I haven't even been in his class yet, you know? And I, oh, it's a long story, I won't tell you, but I, I rebelled and he said, do it anyway, boy. Let's put it that way. So uh, I did it. But Dr. Schrieber taught me probably one of the most important lessons uh, besides when your professor tells you to translate, you just do. That was one of them. But he taught me one of the most important lessons about how we translate the words of the Ten Commandments. We always come up with, thou shalt not, you know, this very heavy, and <clears throat> indeed, it is a commandment. There's no question about it. But we come up with this, again, thou shalt not. And in fact, the Hebrew really reads, you will not. And I tell you that because, you know, when we look at commandments like, committing adultery. You will not commit adultery. You will not commit murder. You will not steal. You will not bear false witness. All of that is derived from a relationship with God, you see. It's not God saying, you better do, but in fact, in relationship to Yahweh, Old Testament name of God, of course, in relationship to Yahweh, this is how you will live. And that's where we're at today in the first commandment. It's a very important uh, commandment to look at in that regard because it's, frankly, as Luther said it, Luther would say, if you could keep the first one, you could keep them all, right? Uh, We can't keep any of them, but that's the beautiful thing about our God is he keeps us, he keeps us in relationship with him. Uh, But this is also, uh, of course, the first commandment, you shall have no other gods. This is also what Luther wrote. Let's say this one together. You should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. And of course, all of us that went through confirmation had to memorize all this stuff. Chills just went down our spine, right? <laughs> yeah, try teaching it to eighth graders. I'm just you know, right? It's hard. All right, so we should fear, love, and trust in God above all things. Now, in my opinion, Luther got these a little bit out of order. And so I'm going to rearrange them for him a little bit. I think what we need to look at is fear and trust first, but then explain fear and trust with love, because I'm going to go back to it. Our God calls us into a relationship with himself. In fact, the Bible's clear. You were chosen to be a Christian from the foundations of the world. Before anybody was on this place, God chose you. You are holy and beloved. Colossians 3 says that very thing. God has uh, instituted, God has brought about, God has, uh, you know, wrapped his arms around you in this love relationship, and he draws you in and says, I want to walk with you in a personal, loving, deep, meaningful relationship all the days, all the days of your life. And so that's how we need to fashion this thing, how we need to look at it. And so let's begin again, as I said it, with the idea of fear. So I don't want to kid you. God is still terrible in the sense of amazing and awesome, right? And so uh, the Bible is quite clear. Hebrews 10, 31. Maybe you have never seen this verse before, but it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands, and, and you understand this principle, fall into the hands of the living God. It's, it's true, Christian, and I, I've said this to you before, but please hear me. We take God way too lightly. We take him way too lightly. In, in our actions, in the way that we talk, I'll, I'll be honest, in the disobedience that we, we affect towards him every day, he says, look, live in love and forgiveness. And we say, no, I, you know what? I think I got a better way. And, and we take him just too lightly. He's God, God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. He's God. The one that said, by the way, to Moses, don't let the people come up on Mount Sinai. If they come up, my presence is going to kill them. That's God. And he's still that. We we have made God to be nicey-nice. And we got to be really careful because he's awesome. And I'm going to use the word again, terrible. Not in the sense of bad, but terrible as in the sense of amazing. All right? 
So let me, let me take you to a passage that gets at that, Acts 9, 1 and 9. If you've got a Bible or device, I encourage you to open it. And if you don't, the, the uh, page number on the screen is the blue Bibles in the pews. Uh, you're welcome to use those too, of course. So Acts 9, 1 and 9, this is a passage. I know that we've studied this before because my sermon notes are in it from the last time we looked at it. But uh, um, Acts 9, 1 and 9 is the conversion of Paul. He, he originally is Saul, gets a, his name changed by Jesus. But frankly, got his, life cha- right, got his life changed by Jesus. But I want you to see something important here about halfway through this segment uh, as to what is going on. So, but Saul, again, that's just the apostle Paul. But Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way, remember that uh, Christianity was called the way in Antioch. It was where they were first called Christian. Uh, So the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, in, in order to try them and kill them, of course. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him. And falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? You've heard me say this before, but don't forget, you persecute Christians, you are persecuting the Lord of the Christians, and he takes it personal, all right? So why are you persecuting me? And he said, who are you, Lord? Now, pause for just a second. I'm going to put this down. What you would imagine is the next thing that is said is, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. That which was said at the burning bush in Exodus 3. You'd imagine that's what it is, because when we think about the awesome and terrible God, we go to the Old Testament, don't we? That's the terrible side of God. And then he turned really nice, and then in the new, he retired. It's really great in the New Testament, right? He's just a nice person, a grandpa figure, right? No, that's not the case. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Hebrew says that about God. Yes, Jesus, but about God, you see. The God of the Old Testament, the God of the burning bush, is the God of the New Testament. And I want you to see it because you, you know what's next. You probably read this segment yourself before. So who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and although his eyes were opened, he saw nothing. He was blinded by the presence of Jesus. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. And then the next thing we find out, notice it's three days, by the way. God always does this. Uh, He has a resurrection of sorts because after that, Ananias comes to him. He heals his eyes. The scales fall from his eyes. He's able to see again. And then in Acts 22, we're told, Ananias says, get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away. All right? So that's that's the advent of the Holy Spirit uh, for St. Paul, resurrection moment. But the reason I bring this to you is we often think of Jesus, and, and please do think of Jesus this way, as the guy that brought the children up on his lap and blessed them. The guy that saw the crowd and had compassion on them. Of course that's who he is. But I want to start in this very important place. We should, in fact, fear God. I often do it for you this way with a visual. You see, when John encountered the risen Christ in the first chapter of the Revelation, you've heard me say this, he fell at his feet as a dead man. We got this idea that he's my buddy. And I've said it to you many times. Hear it again. He is our friend. He said he's our friend. He said to the disciples, I no longer call you servants. I now call you friends. You know my business. You're my friend. But he's not your little buddy. He's not someone to put on a shelf for six days of the week. And on the seventh day, you take him out for an hour. That's not God. He is to be feared. He is awesome. And terrible, but where does, where does, this is not what God wants from you, Christian. It's not what he wants. He wants you to fear him in the sense of awe and reverence, honor, you see. But where does that come from? This is going to be the whole sermon over and over again. Your love relationship with him. What makes God amazing and terrible and awesome, right? He loves me? (laughs) You gotta be kidding me. He wants a relationship with me? I don't know about you, Christian, but that makes me want to lay down at his feet and sing his praises. I can't wait for Revelation 7. Read Revelation 7 at some point today. To be 
at the throne of the Lamb to lay prostrate. I hope that's what it is. I hope that's what heaven is, worshiping his holy name for what he's done for me over and over again. Awe, reverence, yes, but what, what is it driven from? Love, you see. The love relationship that he brought me into is what drives me to honor and respect him as he is, in fact, the God of the universe. And in fact, as we, we continue in, in Acts chapter 9, it it tells us that that fear continued, a healthy fear. I had to put the ellipsis because it's a really long verse. I had to shorten it for you. But So the church was being built up. And look, look at this, walking in the fear of the Lord, honor, respect, reverence, out of love, walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, the church grew. I, I can tell you right now, churches that uh, sell a God that is soft and nicey-nice are dying right now. And you know how I know? They're coming to our church now. Our church is being populated by a calico cat of members from other congregations, not LCMS, that too, but ELCA and Presbyterians and Roman Catholics. They're not being fed the word of God and they're hungry for it. They want to know, what is God? Well, he is indeed an awesome, I'm going to say it one last time, an awesome and terrible God in our love relationship that we honor and respect day after day, all the days of our life until that day again that we walk into heaven and encounter him. All right, so from fear, though, again, Luther went fear, love, and trust in God. I want to go to trust now. I'm going to take it out of order. So trust in God. Isn't this a beautiful verse? This is a I would encourage you to memorize this one. And some of you are going, I can't remember what I had for breakfast, Joe. Probably not going to happen, right? right. But let's say it together because it's so beautiful. When I am afraid, I put my trust in you. And please don't tell me you don't know the truth of this verse. You lived it for the last 13, 14 months. How did we get through this? Oh, vaccine's awesome. God was good to us. No question about it. Thank you, Jesus. And I'm going to say, I say it again. As I said last week when I prayed the prayers, Christian, we are so blessed to be in these United States. You know why I love the United States of America? You just look at what we're dealing with right now. We're at a 1.9% positivity rate in the state of Iowa. That's ridiculous. Why? Because we got it and other nations don't. India and Africa and other nations are suffering. Peru is suffering right now. Thank you, Jesus, for what we have. Thank you, Jesus, for that. And be, please be praying for those other nations. Please, every day, pray for them. Because you do know we are brothers and sisters of the entire world. And all God's people said, amen. Pray for them, all right? But how did we get through it? It wasn't the hope of a vaccine. We got through it because we trust in God. And, and uh, the story I'm going to take you to is a reminder. Listen closely, Christian. A reminder to remember a reminder to remember. I'll explain that in just a second. So Joshua chapter 3. Remember, Joshua is right after the uh, Torah, right after the first five books of the Bible. <laughs> I almost said that makes it the sixth book, but you knew that if it's after the fir first five. <laughs> so, all right. So Joshua is now the leader of Israel. He's, he's transitioning. Moses is gone. Moses is dead. Moses wasn't allowed to go into the Holy Land. I think you know that. Or into the Promised Land, I should say. Uh, and so... Um, uh, Joshua's taking over, but there is a, a really important trust moment in this story that I, I find incredible. So uh, then Joshua rose early in the morning. They're getting ready to go over the River Jordan into the Promised Land. Uh, Joshua rose early in the morning, and they set out, set out from Shittim. And they came to the Jordan, he and all the people of Israel, and lodged there before they passed over the river Jordan. At the end of three days, the officers went through the camp and commanded the people, as soon as you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God being carried by the Levitical priests, then you shall set out from your place and follow it. Yet there shall be a distance between you and it, about 2,000 cubits. Uh, do not come near it in order that you may know the way you shall go, for you have not passed this way before. Then Joshua said to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do mighty wonders, right? Do wonders among you. And Joshua said to the priests, take up the Ark of the Covenant and pass before the people. So they took up the Ark of the Covenant and went before the people. Let me just pause here for explanation. Let me remind you, even though movies make this thing out to be some nuclear box, the Ark of the Covenant that is, that's not its power. It is not powerful in and of itself. It was only powerful because God rested on the top of it. 
in the Holy of Holies, the two cherubim that hold their faces down on the box, and they, they do that. So I'm, I'm going to do it for you as I've done it before. One cherubim is like this. The other cherubim is like this on the top of the Ark of the Covenant. Their faces are down because in between their wings was the presence of God. What the Ark of the Covenant was, was the presence of God, you see. It wasn't, again, a nuclear, well, just watch Raiders of the Lost Ark. I want to forgive me, but the theologian wants to throw up every time I see that, all right? People turning into skeletons and all this weird stuff, all right? But what it was was, and don't get me wrong, the presence of God is awesome and terrible. 2,000 cubits was stay away from it. Don't touch it. Don't go near it. Only the Levites can. And by the way, the Levites even had to hold it with poles. They couldn't touch the box itself because that was God's God's presence. Okay, you got it. So verse 7, the Lord said to Joshua, today I will begin to exalt you in the sight of Israel. He was going to become the leader now instead of Moses, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. And as for you, command the priests who bear the Ark of the Covenant, when you come to the brink of the waters of the Jordan, you shall stand still in the Jordan. And Joshua said to the people of Israel, come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. And Joshua said, here is how you shall know that the living God is among you and that he will be without fail, or and will, he will, excuse me, without fail, drive out from before you the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Girgashites, the Amorites, and the Jebusites. And as I often say it, aren't you glad you're not reading today, right? Uh, Behold, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord is passing before you into the Jordan. Now, therefore, take 12 men from the tribes of Israel, each tribe a man. I'll explain that in a second. And when the soles of the feet of the priests bearing the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, shall rest in the waters of the Jordan, the waters of the Jordan shall be cut off from flowing, and the waters coming down from above shall stand in one heap. And so you know the rest of the story. That's exactly what happens. The priests walk down into the river Jordan. It stops way up here at a city called Adam, as in Adam. Uh, Adam way up here, and it stops down there. And best of all, it's such a beautiful thing. The priests' feet we're on dry ground. You ever seen water recede and there not be mud there? Of course there's going to be. It was dry ground. The 12 guys that they designated brought out stones, and this is important, brought out stones. One stone for each tribe and set it on the other side of the Jordan, stacked it up, and this is beautiful. What it, what it was for was this. Joshua said, when your children ask you, what is that memorial for? You tell them what God has done for you. Let me do it again. It's a reminder to remember. Remember what God has done. Why? You guys, the the Jordan was at flood stage. Have you ever walked into a rushing river with something in your hand and not been afraid? Of course you would be. You, You want something stable, right? They're being very careful with the Ark of the Covenant. They're protecting it, and they're endangering themselves. Why? Because they remembered what God had done before. They remembered what God had done, and that they could trust Him. Why do you trust God? Because you're in a love relationship. I'll go back to it. In a love relationship with Him. What does that mean? You've been able to trust Him before, Christian. You've seen what God has done. I'll say it to you this way. Has God ever let you down? And you might say, yeah, God did let me down that one time. But no, that's just because you misunderstood or better yet, you didn't like the way he did it. God has has never let you down. God will never let you down. Why? Because he's in a love relationship with you. I'll, I'll do it for you this way, Christian. He spilled the blood of his only begotten son to purchase and win you from sin, death, and the power of the devil. Do you think he's going to let you go on it all alone? No. That love relationship drives a trust, a trust in him. And in fact, let me give you a, a, another passage. Let's say this together because you know it well. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. How, how often has it gone well for you when you lean on your own understanding, right? Pretty much slipping and falling in the River Jordan. Trust God. That was a fearful thing that they went through. And yet they knew that God was with them. They knew that God loved them. And so do you. So do you. All in reverence to God, no question. Trusting God, both of which though, come from your love relationship with him. And so 
Here's, here's another. I'm, I'm bringing you guys some verses you may not have, have come across before. It's so good. It's short, but let's say it together. Love the Lord, all you his saints. Don't forget, as a Christian, that's what you are. You're a saint. The, the Bible calls Christians hagios, the holy ones. And that's where we get the word saint from, all right? That's you. Love the Lord. But l- let me tell you why I'm, I'm uh, hammering this nail. So look at the companion passage to what Pastor read just a few moments ago in Matthew. Remembering that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are what we call synoptic gospels. They see the same thing. John is a little different. It's still much of the same information, but it's just seen a little bit differently. And so Matthew, Mark, and Luke are together. And so this is a very important, um, important text. And again, it's one you know. Um, it's where Jesus um, speaks the two great commandments, which are just defining what the Ten Commandments are. First three are love God. Second three are love neighbor. Or second seven, excuse me, are love neighbor. All right? Love God, love neighbor. And so this is how it goes down. One of the scribes, verse 28, came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, asked Jesus, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is hear, O Israel. The Lord your God, the Lord is one. That's the great Shema, that God is one. There is no other. There's not a multiplicity of gods like Egypt had or Rome had. No, there's one God. And you shall, what's the next word? Say the word out loud. Love. Now, pause for a second, Christian. It doesn't say obey, trust, fear, follow. No. What's the great commandment? To love God. That's where it all comes from, you see. Loving God. So love the Lord your God with all your hearts, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no other commandment greater than these, Jesus says. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher, which I love. They tell Jesus, the perfect Lord and God, that he's right. Yeah, well, I wrote the commandments, so yeah, bud, I am right, okay? All right, so you have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Uh, Burn offering, I'm sorry, burn offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, I love this, you are not far from the kingdom of God, which Jesus is saying. You're about 82% there, bro, you know? <laughs> so you're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any questions. I'm going to go back to it, Christian. What is the greatest commandment? Obey, trust, fear, follow, you know, put in, I don't care, put anything you want in there. It's love. Love God. He calls you. He's already called you. He chose you before the foundation of the world to be his kid, to be his son, to be his daughter. That alone engenders his love into us and moves us then to love him back, you see. That's what he calls us to. You struggle with the commandments? then you're maybe struggling with your relationship. And that's no condemnation. That's just a challenge from your friend and your brother. Maybe you need to get your relationship straight. In fact, maybe I should ask you, how is your relationship with God? How is it going? I asked the the worship staff that this week. This is our focus. You tell me. How's it going with your relationship with God? If it's not so hot, that's okay. Let's get you to a better place. This isn't judgment time. This is just challenge time because those of us that love Jesus more than life itself will tell you it's the greatest ride in the world. It's awesome to be in a distinct and deep and loving relationship with my Jesus. Are you kidding me? I don't want anything else. If I died today, I'd be a happy man. And there's many in this room that feel that same way. And if you're not there, it's not judgment. It's not. It's come with us. Come see how amazing he is. And then you'll see again, from the love of relationship that you have with God, all the other things fall into place. In fact, uh, again, a short verse. Got a few memory. See, I gave the short ones for us senior citizens. Okay, all right. So let's say it together. I love you, O Lord, my strength. And uh, clearly, my brothers and sisters in Christ, my career 
is helping people to love Jesus more. And I pray that you'd be enabled to do that, needless to say. And, I, and, and this is the thing, this is the promise. If you're not there and you need help, you call me. Coffee, I don't care, whatever we have to do. I've discipled people for six months at a time. If that's what you need, that's what we're gonna do. I want you to have that love relationship with Jesus. Because that's, I love you that much. I do, I love you. And I want you to have that as well. All right, so, so I had another wedding yesterday and um, <laughs> it was one, the reason kids are getting married in October now is it was 96 degrees yesterday, right? It was insane. I wouldn't want to be in a tux on a 96 degree day, but all right. So a um, uh, really wonderful couple, just cool story of how they came together. Just really neat. Uh, but when I did their message, uh, this happened uh, about four or five months ago, and I told you about the sim- similar thing. Uh, I was uh, preaching on Colossians 3. I quoted it a moment ago. That you're chosen. That you're holy. That you're beloved by God. And I'm looking right at Connor, the, the groom, when I'm saying this and telling him, you're, man, you're chosen. You're loved. You're beloved. God, God chose you from the foundation of the world, man. This is, you know, I'm, I tend to be vociferous when I talk about this stuff, all right? And so I look up at Connor and there's just tears streaming down his face. You know, you don't see grooms do that very often at their wedding. Most of the time they're nervous, right? He knows that relationship. He has that relationship. And I pray that you would have that relationship too. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.